Good morning, everyone. I'm going to uh, reverse things a little today and start out by sharing another Rays of Kindness story. Today I want to talk about Renita Marshall of Barrie, who works for the state at the Department of Environmental Conservation. Renita has a passion for helping others. And several years ago, she came across a friend who said they wouldn't be able to afford a tree or gifts that year. So she asked members of her community to help the family through the holidays, which included a gift drive. For the past decade, she's done similar projects for other families. And this year, decided to make an official charity, the Renita Marshall Helping Hands Foundation, to make sure kids get presents during the holiday season, as well as food and school supplies. Renita is certainly another great example of how Vermont lights the way. So I want to thank her as well as Vermonters who have supported her efforts. In a few moments, Commissioner Pichek will show you our latest data on modeling. As you'll see, while cases are higher than we'd like, they're better than they we've seen in weeks. To start, there's been a decline in regional case growth over the last week. And while that doesn't necessarily make a trend, it's something to note. In Vermont, we've stabilized, seeing several days with fewer than 100 cases, which again is higher than we'd like to see, but shows vast improvement. I want to thank Vermonters for their work and their sacrifices, which helped get us to this point. It's been a little over a month since we took significant steps to slow the rising spread of the virus and it's clearly working. As a reminder, this included shutting down bars and clubs, closing restaurants at 10 p.m., and making sure there's only one household at a table at 50% occupancy and tables spaced apart. We also required quarantine for all non-essential travel, pause recreational and school sports, and of course, prohibited social and recreational gatherings of all sizes between multiple households. Now, I know this has been hard, especially not being able to gather with family, but it's made a difference. In the meantime, our team has been playing offense, significantly expanding testing capacity by opening on-demand testing sites at 19 locations across the state and adding 140 new contact tracers to our tracing team and tools to reach contacts faster, which helps us find and contain cases. Based on all these factors, which improved our numbers in Vermont and the strict measures that will remain in place and with an understanding that mental health has to be considered alongside physical health, we're announcing some small changes to our guidance today. First, we're making a small, short-term modification to our gathering policy. But before I get into those details, I want to stress, there's a risk of COVID transmission when people gather, especially indoors and without masking. Staying smart, using common sense, and following our guidance is the best way to limit risks for yourself and others. However, given our virus case numbers have leveled out and that the other stringent measures will remain in place, gathering with one other trusted household will be allowed from December 23rd through January 2nd. What this means is that small gatherings between two trusted households will be allowed for the holiday season. And then we'll take a break to collect data and once uh, we get the data collected, we'll, we'll see where we go from there. To be clear, households may choose one trusted household to gather during this period. Gathering with more than one household, even if it's on different days, is not permitted. Again, while we're providing a narrow path to very small holiday gatherings, you really need to think about whether it fits your family or your situation especially if you're over 65, have pre-existing conditions, or work with vulnerable po populations, such as in healthcare. As well, if you do gather 
we strongly encourage everyone to get tested seven days afterwards. Testing is free and much easier than ever before. You can pre-register for a test at healthvermont.gov. Now, it's also important to know that if the one other household you choose to gather with is from outside Vermont, everyone from both households must quarantine for seven days and get a test, or quarantine for 14 days. Again, our travel policy has not changed, so anyone traveling in or out of Vermont must follow the quarantine requirements for our state and the state you're traveling to. Next, for outdoor recreation, like sliding, snowshoeing, snowmobiling, cross-country skiing, ice fishing, hiking, and other outdoor activities, we are returning to prior guidance, which means as long as you can physically distance and wear a mask, you can participate in these activities with others outside your household. But you've got to follow the arrive, play, leave approach, meaning mingling afterwards is not allowed. You don't have to look any further than the hockey outbreak in South Vermont to see how dangerous one tailgate party can be. This outdoor recreation guidance can be found under section 4.1 of ACCD's WorkSafe guidance. Finally, we'll be moving into a phased restart of youth, recreational, and school sports. So, beginning December 26th, school-based and youth recreational sports teams may begin practices with individual skills, strength, and conditioning drills. This means no contact, physically distance, and wearing a mask at all times. And with schools on winter break, it's, like, it's likely many will wait until they return in January, but that's up to the schools. This does not include adult rec leads and spectators continue to be prohibited. I'm grateful for the work Vermonters have done to level out our number of cases and to start to see a decrease and I believe these are the right steps at this time, but it's important to remember that the gains we've made are fragile and we'll only hold them if we remain smart. And again, all other mitigation measures, including bar and social club closures, as well as restaurant closures at 10 p.m., occupancy limits and others will remain in place. Which brings me to my next topic. And our next guest. While the vaccine distribution continues and we see light at the end of the tunnel, we know we'll still be managing this virus over the months ahead and that many Vermonters will continue to be impacted. Now, I hope we'll be able to roll back restrictions further, but the financial impact on our businesses and those still unemployed has been significant. That's why I was relieved to see Congress pass a combined $1.4 trillion budget bill and a $900 billion stimulus bill this week. This will help us continue to provide unemployment benefits, stimulus money to help families with basic needs, and more support for small businesses across Vermont. Before I turn it over to Congressman Welch, I'd uh, also like to remind Vermonters that if able, to support our Vermont businesses by buying local for the holidays and beyond. If you need ideas, go to buyvermontmade.com, where the Department of Tourism and Marketing has created a great resource to help you shop local. And don't forget, a gift card to your favorite restaurant will go a long way to helping our restaurants stay open in the weeks and months ahead. Now I'll turn it over to our great friend, Congressman Peter Welch. Um, uh, thank you very much, Governor. Uh, I've been watching and listening to many of your press conferences, and I just want to say as a citizen uh, and as one Vermonter, uh, I'm very grateful, and I think all Vermonters are very grateful uh, to the leadership that you've provided, uh, that your team has provided uh, to make Vermont really the envy uh, of the country. My colleagues in Washington are always asking me how it is uh, that we have kept our infection rate 
uh, so low, mostly the lowest in the country. Uh, and I think it's been clear, consistent leadership uh, and commitment on the part of our governor and his team. And I think it's been a real sense of community uh, and solidarity among Vermont citizens who understand that taking the precautions that are recommended are not just about their own health, it's their contribution to try to assure the health of fellow Vermonters who they care about and love. So I want to thank you, Governor and uh, Mark and Commissioner. Um, the, the Governor was alluding to the reality uh, of the pandemic and its economic consequences, and we know that. And there's disparate impacts depending on where you are. Some sectors of the economy are doing well. But everyday Vermonters, uh, folks who work in restaurants, folks who have kids at home, and they're trying to juggle homeschooling along with whatever is allowed at school, uh, folks who have small businesses where they're really devoted to their employees and they're wondering how they're gonna hang on, uh, they need financial relief. And the obligation of the federal government uh, is, to be, is to be that fiscal backstop uh, to help our individual citizens, our families, our small businesses uh, in our state to get from here to there. And we had that first relief package, $2.2 trillion back in March. All economists, conservative, liberal orientation, believe that that was a, a lifeline uh, for our states and our citizens and our businesses to hang on. When we passed that back in uh, early April, I think there was a hope that COVID would be in the rear view mirror by December, and it's not. The infection rate is the highest it's been. And the good news, of course, is we have a vaccine, and there is an aggressive effort uh, to distribute the vaccine and to uh, get it injected into every citizen. That's gonna take a while. And it took us a while in Washington to supplement the aid package that is absolutely essential so that folks and businesses, now that the end is in sight with the vaccine, can hang on and get from here to there. And uh, Governor, you mentioned stimulus, but you know, in fact, it's survival for a lot of our businesses. You know, the economic situation we have is not a function of a downturn in the economy or bad management among businesses or a sector. Uh, it's really a function of businesses having to take steps to comply with uh, health requirements that's caused them to, to have revenue hemorrhages. So this is about hanging on. And it's like we're on one side of the bridge, we can see the other side, the vaccine's there. But as we make that journey, we've got to make sure that those businesses, that have, the businesses like our restaurants uh, and others that have been hanging on by the fingernails can make it. And I think that's ultimately what brought Congress together you know, over what had been a long and prolonged negotiation. And among the provisions that are in this $900 billion package uh, that have been reported are one $300 in weekly expanded unemployment. And that's down from the 600 that was originally uh, in, in the CARES package, uh, but that supplement uh, at the expense of the federal government will continue for 10 weeks. And I remember, Governor, you talking about those 12,000 Vermonters who were looking at the cliff uh, of losing unemployment uh, right by the new year and how dire that would be for them. So there's additional time, 10 weeks, to help folks with that unemployment. Uh, there's direct payments in this bill. In the original bill, it was $1,200 per individual, up to $75,000. This one is $600, but that means that if you're a family of four, that's a $2,400 uh, check that you'll be getting very soon. There's a 15% increase in supplemental nutritional assistance at three squares Vermont, as we know it. That is so important. You know, a lot of the anxiety and a lot of the suffering that some Vermonters are experiencing is largely invisible to others. Uh, but I was up in Newport uh, last week uh, where there was a food distribution program that was run by the Vermont Food Bank, uh, the guard was helping, um, and the Abbey Group. And the cars were lined up uh, for a mile uh, to get this food. It's real. 
and the fact that there's 15% a bump in that nutrition assistance is really going to make the difference uh, in food security for a lot of our families. $284 billion in additional payroll protection plan funds. Now, this is going to be continue to be very important for all of our small businesses, uh, particularly our restaurants. And we didn't get a specific restaurant bill in that I supported, but we got supplemental money uh, in the payroll protection plan that can be of benefit to our restaurants. We have to help them make it to the other side. $25 billion in rental assistance, uh, and including in, in another month uh, extension of the eviction moratorium. Uh, $20 billion to purchase vaccine doses, and $9 billion for vaccine distribution. This is really, really important for every single state, but this is going to mean that the state will have the resources to provide free, free vaccination to all of our citizens. So on the health side, that's going to be really important to every Vermonter. Uh, there's $22 billion for states to institute as we've been doing, testing, tracing, and mitigation practices. Education is getting significant aid. $54 billion is available to K through 12 public schools, and that is to help with the challenge and expense of reopening under different circumstances to, that require uh, the social distancing. Also, $22 billion for nonprofit, public, and private colleges and universities. This has been brutal on our higher education system as well because they've uh, had to make huge accommodations, incur significant expenses, uh, and this aid will be available to help those colleges and institutions. $10 billion in child care assistance. And one area uh, that's been really important here in Vermont, but all around the country, is broadband. The whole debate in Washington about broadband and its importance in rural America has changed since March. I was the head of the broad I am the head of the broadband caucus. In pre-COVID, I was uh, having to make the case to my colleagues that rural America needed broadband because they thought we had it. Well, now with COVID, you can't uh, not only do your homework; you can't go to school without broadband. You can't have telehealth without broadband, and many people can't work without broadband. So there's a total consensus about the absolute existential requirement that rural America have city-style, city-speed broadband. And there's $7 billion in this. $3.2 billion is to help lower-income people pay for access to service. $300 million for rural broadband build-up, and $250 million for telehealth and $65 million to properly map. And by the way, it was Vermont, you know, the mapping. I don't know if you remember this. But the FCC was telling us in Vermont and other rural areas that we had great broadband because their map said that if one person in a quadrant had high-speed internet, it meant everybody had it. Well, of course, we know that's not true, but it was proven when the Public Service Department did a survey by driving around and actually getting the real data. And we've successfully uh, focused on the absolute essential necessity of getting good maps. Now, there's a couple of things uh, that are in the bill that uh, we've been working on for a long time and the governor's been advocating. But one of them, governor, is late in the game but we did get an extension to December 31 of next year for the use of the CARES money. It would have been helpful if we'd gotten that extension long ago, but as I understand it, it is going to allow some reprogramming of some money to make that go a little bit further. And then the final thing that I want to highlight is a bill that, was that I introduced in the House, along with a Republican colleague from Austin, Texas, uh, Roger Williams, and it was called save our stages. And incorporated into this legislation, the relief package, is $15 billion, which was in my legislation, to essentially provide financial assistance to independent venues where there are performances. And uh, Senator Schumer got very excited about it in the Senate, and this now is part of the package. I want to say why I think that's so important. 
when we get to the other side of COVID, all of those wonderful organizations and small businesses, nonprofits, all those ones that we have in Barry, that we have in White River Junction, that we have in Burlington, that we have in Rutland, Paramount Theater, we need those to be there when we get to the other side because they are so essential in the quality of local community life. So having aid to help those folks hang on until we get to that other side of COVID is really important so that when we get there, we haven't left them behind. So that's the broad outline. There's gonna be a lot of details that have to be worked out as has been the case. Uh, and I'm uh, pledging to work with the governor as guidance comes down from Treasury, as guidance comes down from small business or the USDA to make certain that if there are problems, we get on it as quickly as possible to try to make certain that whatever guidance emerges, we saw this with the CARES package, we're able to try to address it very quickly and in a way that maximizes the benefit uh, to Vermonters, Vermont citizens, families, uh, and state government. Uh, the final thing, Governor, uh, you've been pushing with many of your fellow governors to get state aid. I totally support that. We were not successful in getting a direct aid to the states and municipalities. Uh, I believe that is something that President-elect Biden is committed to. I think it's absolutely essential. And one of the reasons I think it's essential is that the flexibility that Vermont had and the decisions that were made by the governor and our legislature that allowed them to provide some help to hospitality, to tailor things to what we need here in the state of Vermont is really essential. So this will be something that we continue to pursue. Uh, and Governor, I'm glad uh, that you'll be continuing to play a leadership role in that. I would say that <clears throat> the letters that you sent with some of your fellow governors and Republican governors outlining the need to get a package together, have Congress act, was very helpful because it created additional pressure on Republicans and Democrats in Congress uh, to do what we all know had to be done, and that was provide additional aid uh, to our states and communities and families uh, to help us get through the financial uh, 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 pressure that's imposed by COVID. Uh, so thank you all very much, and it's a good day uh, that we can, we can say the bill is on the way to the president to be signed and help us on the way to Vermonters to help to get us through uh, the holidays and in the winter. Thank you. Hey, now, Commissioner Pichak. I have the honor of introducing Commissioner Pichak, who's been doing a great job. Thank you, Commissioner. Come on up. Well, thank you very much, uh, Congressman Welsh, and thank you very much for your excellent work in D.C. and the excellent news that you brought uh, here to Vermont today. Uh, yesterday, on the first day of what is predicted to be a long winter in the United States, our country crossed yet another grim milestone, recording our 18 millionth case, with four and a half million of those cases coming so far just in the month of December. Not only are COVID cases rising more quickly than at any other time during the pandemic, but today a record number of Americans are hospitalized with COVID-19 and our seven day fatality rate is higher than at any previous point during the pandemic. However, as parts of our country, including our own, have real reason for optimism. First, while cases remain high across the US, some hard hit states like Ohio, Minnesota, and North Dakota are finally seeing some improvement in their cases, while other hot spots have emerged, particularly in California, Tennessee, and Texas. And just to give you a sense of how significant the increase is in California, had you removed those cases from the U.S. count, our cases as a country would actually have gone down week over week. This week in the Northeast, we saw a 4% decrease in cases totaling 145,000 this week. This is a sign for, of improvement, as the governor mentioned, for this is the first time in 16 weeks that our regional week-over-week -week case count has actually decreased. Further, over the past five days, hospitalizations across the region have also stabilized. 
However, as we can see from the heat map, we must remain cautious as cases continue to surround our state and the regional positivity rate remains high as well. There are 521 counties in our travel region. Of the 10 counties with the lowest active case number throughout the region, eight of those counties are now located in Vermont. Again, making Vermont stand out in the region for its response to this pandemic. This past week, Vermont also crossed the 6,000 case mark, adding an additional 1,000 cases at a constant 10-day rate. Turning to our weekly numbers, we reported 685 cases this week, a reduction of 89 cases from the week before, and most importantly, our positivity rate continues to trend down, with the seven-day average below 2% for the first time in December. Additional good news, our Vermont forecast is also trending better. While cases are expected to rise over the next four weeks, there has been a significant reduction in the, in the rate of that increase. And I am still optimistic that Vermonters will be able to beat even this improved forecast. There are a couple of notes of caution in our numbers, as you may have noticed from the heat map, both Chittenden County and Bennington County stand out uh, for the number of active cases in those two counties. And in fact, cases in those counties have been going up over the last few weeks with a positivity rate that has been going up as well. And if you remove those counties from our total statewide count, the state of Vermont has actually been trending down for a few weeks. So it's a note of caution for anyone in Vermont because cases can be anywhere, but particularly for those that live in those counties um, that they should pay particular attention to public health guidance. Similarly, looking at last year's travel trends, there's another reason for caution. Uh, over the ski season, over the Christmas to New Year's period, more people visited Vermont during that week than any other time in that previous year. Uh, a significant increase even over Thanksgiving, Labor Day, Fourth of July. Uh, many traveled for the holidays, many more traveled to ski at our great ski mountains. Uh, so while um, fresh snow is now landed in Vermont and across the region, uh, attracting skiers from across the area, it's all the more important for us in Vermont and for all of our guests and visitors to be mindful of our guidance and to follow it uh, completely uh, to ensure that cases stay low here in Vermont. Re regarding some updates on long-term care and our K-12 system, this week the outbreak at Valley Vista in Bradford was officially deemed closed, but we did add three new outbreaks in long-term care facilities. In total, we're reporting 121 new cases in long-term care facilities, totaling 485 today. As we can see from this chart, cases in long-term care facilities account for only a small percentage of Vermont's overall case count, about 6%. Tragically, however, residents in these facilities make up over 70% of our deaths in Vermont. Again, really emphasizing how critical it is to get this population vaccinated and also how critical it is for all of us as a community to follow the public health guidance to keep our case rates low so that these facilities can protect their residents. Just under 500 new K through 12 cases were reported across the region uh, with 288 of those cases reported in the state of Maine, 162 reported in New Hampshire and just 37 here in Vermont. In closing, I'd like to highlight another optimistic tone uh, about our upcoming or current flu season. Among the challenges this winter will bring include successfully managing the current flu season along with the COVID-19 resurgence. It's critical that we keep our seasonal flu numbers down so that our hospitals are free to treat that increase that we might see in COVID-19 patients. This fall, we studied recent flu seasons in Vermont to help forecast how many Vermonters might need hospital care and developed a range of possible outcomes from more pessimistic to more optimistic. We took a close look at the countries in the Southern Hemisphere as well that just closed out their flu season to see what might be in store for us in the United States. Again, good news, countries like Argentina and Australia, the flu was virtually non-existent this year. 
signaling very good news for us up here in the Northeast and making us uh, uh, confident that our more optimistic outcome will come into play. Further, the increased rate of flu vaccination by Vermonters provides additional hope. We currently stand at about 80% of our goal for the current flu season and are 11% ahead of where we stood at this time last year. Additionally, now about 10 weeks or so into the flu season here in the United States, the early results are similarly encouraging, with hospital visits for flu-like symptoms down considerably compared to previous flu seasons. All of this adds up to the fact that in Vermont, we are in a very strong position to treat all of those Vermonters who need hospitalization, whether it's for flu or for COVID. You'll see from our modeling forecast that for medical surgical beds, um, even in a pessimistic flu season uh, scenario, which we do not believe will happen, we have much greater capacity than we need to treat Vermonters that would likely need care. Similarly, regarding ICU units, the same story plays out, that we have sufficient care to treat those Vermonters, again, who uh, might be sick with the flu or might contract COVID. Uh, and as the peak of the flu season here in Vermont generally lands in January, at least in terms of hospitalizations, uh, this is certainly very welcomed news. And at this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Levine. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think I'll go off script for a second, um, recognizing that the majority of the Vermont population will not receive COVID vaccine in the next several months. So I encourage all those who have yet to obtain their flu vaccine to take advantage of that time right now. Thank you much. <clears throat> so after three consecutive days, where case counts uh, for new cases were in the low 90s. Last evening brought only 63 new cases, but unfortunately one additional death. There are currently 36 patients in the hospital, nine in the ICU. The EPI teams are following 293 situations and following 41 outbreaks. 19 of which are in healthcare settings, and as you saw in one of the last slides, 11 of which are in long term care facility settings. It's very obvious that Vermonters are indeed accessing a sufficient amount of testing as our percent positivity rate remains low and has been equal or less than 2.2%. On the vaccine front, by the end of today, Vermont will have received 11,400 doses of the newly emergency use authorized Moderna vaccine. We'll also receive some more Pfizer this week, and as announced last Friday, a slightly lower than anticipated allocation of 3,900 doses. Over the two week period that will have elapsed by the end of this week, that will make 18,725 doses total, well on our way to the 34,000 doses expected by the end of the month. Long-term care, long care facilities will have received 3,400 doses of Pfizer over the two weeks, and yesterday marked the first day of the contracted pharmacies vaccinating our nursing home residents. <clears throat> The number of vaccine doses provided thus far to Vermonters is 3,141. Remember, that's from about 3,900 doses that we received last week. Hospitals are now mobilized to vaccinate their own healthcare workforce and also mobilizing and actively vaccinating healthcare workers at higher risk in their regions, which include primary care. OBGYN, dental practices, EMS, and others. <clears throat> I'm not going to repeat everything I said on Friday regarding the Moderna vaccine. However, in response to abundant Vermonters' questions and concerns, I'd like to help dispel some miscommunications about mRNA vaccine 
Recall mRNA vaccine is where a tiny piece of genetic material, the nucleic acid, which codes for the instructions to make the viral spike protein, is introduced into our muscle cells, leading to our immune system developing antibodies against this viral protein. <clears throat> First misconception, there is no live virus in this vaccine, so you cannot get COVID from it. Second, the mRNA never enters the nucleus of our cells, the place where our own DNA is stored. So it cannot interact with this DNA, and in fact, our cell breaks down the mRNA soon after it does its job making the spike protein. Third, though you will probably test positive on an antibody blood test after you receive the vaccine, you will not test positive on the kind of test we do for active disease from nasal swabs. <clears throat> Fourth, even though these two mRNA vaccines are the first out of the starting block, this does not mean they were rushed into production. They're actually being held to the same rigorous safety and effectiveness standards as all other types of vaccines are. Finally, even people who may have had or may think they have had COVID-19 should still get the vaccine, as it can still benefit them, and we don't know how long natural immunity will protect them. Moving to another vaccine topic, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices voted on Sunday to recommend that the next priority group to get the vaccine be people age 75 or older and what they termed frontline essential workers, which include first responders, teachers, and food service workers, among others. Our own Vaccine Implementation Advisory Group is meeting tomorrow to consider these recommendations and come up with their own conclusions and help finalize Vermont's plan for 1B. Because everyone is now asking about it, I'm just going to say a word about the new SARS-CoV-2 virus strain found in Great Britain. This is a genetically distinct variant that's now been labeled B117 that many scientists believe is 70% more contagious than previous strange, strains and probably more infectious in children. It does not seem to cause more severe disease. Investigators are still working to determine if the vaccine is effective against it, but there are no reasons to believe that it would not be. This process of mutation is not unusual in the virus world. Continuing to do all the same mitigation measures we always use every day to prevent ourselves from getting COVID-19 is still in order. <clears throat> Finally, I also want to just acknowledge an important situation that arose in conjunction with surveillance testing. Last week, Barry and Milton school surveillance tests never made it to the Broad uh, site in Boston on time due to shipping delays. It is a self-administered test that's then collected at the school from teachers and school staff and then shipped directly from the schools to Broad using UPS. For Milton, we are going to be retesting those staff today. And for Barry, because they are already on break, we will retest upon their return from break. Now, I'm really happy to join Governor Scott in giving Vermonters a bit of good news today. Indeed, your work preventing COVID-19 has been so important throughout the pandemic, but it has been especially critical in the past month or so when we really had to act fast to slow a sudden surge in cases. We have thus far continued to lead New England in this effort, as Commissioner Pichak has shown you, but do not forget the higher prevalence of the virus among us, its ability to infect colleagues at work, students and teachers, and its impact on a healthcare system, and importantly, our skilled nursing facilities. The number of people with COVID-19 in Vermont is still higher than we were once used to, but our cases are quite stable right now, as I've told you. 
We have regular testing available in many parts of Vermont and have made new strides in the area of contact tracing. Our data shows us we're in a better position with regards to new cases and our hospitals are coping well with demand. But despite our holiday season pause in our guidance on multi-household gatherings and new adherence to gather with one other trusted household, this really doesn't change anything I've said before about COVID-19 prevention. And I will say it again. As the CDC has said, the safest thing is still to celebrate the holidays at home with the people you already live with. But for those of us who do choose to gather with that single trusted household, remember there are always ways to keep it safe. Keep it as small as possible, wear masks, try to avoid eating and drinking when you can, as the data we collected before the ban on multi-household gatherings clearly implicated circumstances like sharing meals and being without masks as instrumental to our increase in cases. Keep a six foot distance, yes, even indoors, and go outside whenever you can. And always stay away from others if you're sick, no matter how minor your symptoms may be. We strongly encourage everyone to plan ahead to get tested seven days after such a gathering. And if you gather with anyone outside of Vermont, everyone involved should plan to quarantine. Stay home and away from others, either for 14 days or seven days with a negative test result, as long as you have no symptoms. Our travel policy has not changed. Any travel to or from Vermont still requires quarantine. We still do not recommend any gathering that involves a person over age 65, a person with underlying medical conditions, or those who work with higher risk populations, such as healthcare settings. Many of our recent deaths have been in long-term care facilities, but these group living facilities are not the only risk. And anyone with a high risk medical condition is also at risk of severe illness with COVID. I know it isn't easy for these Vermonters to continue to be isolated after all this time, but we still need to keep them all safe until they can get vaccinated. We hope that day will not be too far off into the future now. While it's been a tough year and many of us will still miss one another this holiday season with smaller celebrations that just won't be the same. But if we do spend a little time with just one other person or family, safely, I hope it will give us the mental and emotional boost many of us need right now. In just the same way, our youth will benefit from time spent in the outdoors, pursuing the winter sports they love and can train in safely. Everyone's mental health benefits from such activities and we want to encourage them as they mean so much to both mental and physical health. And as the days now officially start to get a bit longer, I encourage you to get outside as much as possible. Enjoy the snow and all that Vermont has to offer. This is what always helps Vermonters get through the winter, and this year should be no different. We can do this and still protect our communities from further spread. We just need to be constantly vigilant and thoughtful and always adapt our activities in ways that keep us all safe and protect the most susceptible amongst us. I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine, Commissioner Pichek, and Congressman Welch. Uh, Congressman Welch will be here for those on the phone, so any questions you might have uh, can be directed to him. Uh, with that, we'll open it up to questions. Right, we are approaching 12 o'clock, so just would ask to get to one or two questions and any additional we can always help you get answered afterwards. We'll start in the room with Calvin. Uh, so I guess a, a kind of a two-pronged question for you and the congressman. So maybe for the congressman first. Um, when all is said and done, how much money are we receiving from this package? And also, Governor, um, as the congressman <coughs> mentioned and you previously expressed concerns, this doesn't include any money for state and municipal budgets. So I'm wondering, as we enter this, this next legislative session that's going to be, of course, 
dominated by finance discussions about financial relief. Um, what what sort of policies are, are you thinking about for, for fiscal relief uh, going forward? Uh, we don't know exactly what each state allocation will be. Vermont has generally done well with the small state minimum. Something goes back to when Senator Jeffords was in the Senate and has been safeguarded by Senator Leahy. Uh, so we don't know the specific amounts, uh, but we will get our share. Secondly, uh, the governor will be answering this on state aid, which I agree with him we absolutely need. But there is money in here that helps the state meet obligations. All that money that is going to be available for administering the vaccine, for getting the vaccine, um, all that money that's available for uh, the, the payroll protection plan, the housing money. So there's some, the education money, that alleviates some of the burden that would be on the state. Uh, but we will need more. Yeah, Kelvin. Um you know, the details do matter. And uh, I was speaking with um, First uh, Senator Sanders uh, last week, uh, but uh, Senator Leahy yesterday. And uh, the combined um, uh, bill uh, was uh, about 24 inches uh, high, over 5,000 pages. Uh, so within the $1.4 trillion budget bill, uh, there's some good news in there for Vermont. And uh, Senator Leahy will be uh, talking about those uh, those uh, bits of good information uh, for our financial picture, uh, that will be helpful. Um, but we'll be presenting. Uh, you know, we we are going to uh, play the cards we're dealt. Uh, as I've said, we'll be presenting a budget that will be balanced, uh, and uh, and we'll be continuing to do whatever we can uh, to focus on the fundamentals uh, to try and you know, grow the economy, make Vermont more affordable, protect the most vulnerable. And we'll continue to do that in this next budget cycle. But uh, again, while well, we could use uh, some help, and I know other states are in different uh, uh, diff different situations, uh, mainly because of their fiscal years. You know, we're in the middle of our fiscal year, so we don't. Uh, we're all set until um, you know the first of July. Uh, it's fiscal year 22 that we'll be developing the budget for. And again, uh, as uh, Congressman Walsh has said. I believe the uh, president-elect uh, Biden has talked uh, about uh, maybe more financial aid for the states. So we'll see what happens. But our budget will be balanced, and uh, we'll deal with the reality. And then one last follow-up question for Dr. Levine. Um, a few weeks ago, leading up to Thanksgiving, we said that 70% of cases about more or less were, were um, tr traced back to gatherings. Where does that number stand right now? Where are we seeing the most spread? Just to clarify what you said, Calvin, it's 70 percent of cases that are associated with an outbreak. Um, oh. But that number is now um, in the 60-ish percent range, um, so still significant. But what we saw with Halloween and with a number of uh, social events that occurred around that time was an increase in cases. Uh, we did not see that same thing happen after Thanksgiving. Uh, it was very heartening to continue to follow the data. And really, we were not seeing uh, abundant examples of large gatherings of people at Thanksgiving leading to new cases and significant outbreaks. So that data has continued to uh, well past the 14 days post Thanksgiving to, to be true. And you've seen our most recent data. So we feel very comfortable with the way the data has evolved. And I frankly I trust Vermonters uh, to do the right things in this next period of time because they've kind of told us by their behaviors all along that safety is priority for them and health is a priority. So we hope that will continue. Thank you. Questions from a viewer today. Um, with some testing sites being closed around the holidays, how is the state making sure all Vermonters have access to adequate testing after Christmas? Yeah, um, well, we've done a tremendous amount of work uh, with some of these uh, on demand testing centers. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, there's 19 that we have uh, today, which uh, probably a month, month and a half ago was in the single digits. So we've made uh, great strides in that area. 
Um, I don't know the holiday schedule. I don't know if uh, Secretary Smith might be on the line and might be able to give us uh, some insight. And if not, maybe we come back to that. Secretary Smith? Yeah. Yes, Governor. Um, we do have testing cap uh, capability happening over the holidays. I think there's the state lab will be open on the 24th, for example. Um, we'll be closed on the 25th, but the testing cap capability will will have testing capability over the holidays. I think the only time that we won't have testing capabilities is uh, Christmas Eve, but Christmas and thereon we will. Now, I want, to, I want to distinguish here for, for a minute. Um, that is uh, asymptomatic testing. If you have symptoms, call your provider. There will be immediate testing for anybody that has, um, uh, has symptoms. We will make sure that uh, either through the health network um, and other facilities that there are testing for those with symptoms, uh, but asymptomatic testing, it looks like um, on the 24th is the only date that we will have um, no on-demand testing. Okay. And then just one more question. Um, given that it takes about a week for people to develop symptoms and, and get a test, what are you doing to make sure that schools are safe to open on January 4th since some people may be developing symptoms if they gathered for Christmas about a week later? Uh, Dr. Levine. So again, we're asking people for a one-week period after having a gathering with another household uh, to follow our guidance that we've had all along regarding uh, quarantining and getting a test. So I think that should be in itself protective of all of our workplaces, schools, and other sites. I'd like to just add to what Secretary Smith said also, um, that differentiation between symptomatic and asymptomatic is critical, because obviously sick people need care even on Christmas Day. Um, the healthcare system has capacity to do on-demand testing when it's a critical part of the evaluation of a patient, uh, whether it's in their own four walls or whether it's at an urgent care center, uh, if that happens to be open. People probably won't need asymptomatic testing on Christmas Day um, in terms of, uh, you know, the day seven testing out policy or having been to a gathering a week before. So uh, that's not something that should be urgent. So any Vermonter who needs a test will usually need it because they're ill during that time period. In between the two holidays, Christmas and New Year's, it's pretty much business as usual and uh, all of the test sites will be open. And in fact, on the 26th, three of the test sites are actually having extended hours. Thank you. Jolie? Hi, yes. Um, I wanted to inquire about um, Dr. Troy Bennon, who's the chief medical officer from CVS Health. Um, he says he is uh, coming to northern Vermont with a team in the middle of the week um, to oversee vaccinations of the Pfizer um, version uh, to see it set in action in rural settings. Is that true? Um, this may be breaking news for us as well. I, I have not uh, had any word on that. Uh, Dr. Levine, anything uh, you may have heard? Secretary Smith, Commissioner Sherling, either? Anybody heard of someone from? Yes. Governor, I, I, I could not hear the question. Was that, what was the organization, what pharmacy? Yeah, uh, the chief medical officer of CVS. Uh, uh, says chief medical there. officer at CVS is coming, or apparently allegedly coming to Vermont next week uh, to oversee some of the rural operations. Anything we've heard about? Nothing that I've heard, Governor. We'll, Nothing we'll, from public safety, Governor. Jolie, if you hear anything more, maybe you could let us know. Yeah, uh, and if I could ask one more question. Um, now that we are um, able to gather with a single trusted household um, over the holidays, I wanted to know uh, what's making it possible uh, to do that? Well, really, it's about our case counts. And uh, when, if you recall back uh, when we had to implement all of this, um, when we had the outbreak uh, at the hockey, uh, at the, the skating facility in, in Washington County, uh, we had a number, a number of large parties, Halloween parties at that point. 
uh, and that uh, that furthered the problem. Um, so uh, in between that time, we put these measures into place. We're seeing now a finally a reduction uh, plateaued, maybe a little bit of a reduction even since yesterday, which is great news uh, for us. And uh, so we thought it was time. You know, we paid, uh, you know, Vermonters have paid dearly uh, to be in the position we're in today. And uh, we thought that this was a step forward uh, back to where we were uh, pre-Halloween in some respects uh, and thought we could start mitigating our way back out of this. So one small, very, very small step uh, at a time uh, to make sure that we don't impact uh, in a detrimental way uh, anybody in the future. But we think we feel good about what we're doing and uh, we think that it's good for mental health in terms of outdoor recreation and, and youth sports as well. So again, very incremental changes, but we'll pay attention, watch the data, and then make changes as necessary. Thank you. All right, moving to the phone lines, we'll start with Andrea, seven days. Yeah, I think uh, actually the number might be, I don't know what the number is that you have, but we'll let Dr. Levine update you on that. So where you're uh, probably questioning, if you look at the doses allocated to the healthcare system, that adds up to approximately 38 to 3,900. Over 3,100 of those doses were used. Additional doses went to long-term care, directly shipped to the pharmacies that are administering the vaccine in the federal pharmacy partnership that's been set up. The first doses of that would have been administered yesterday, uh, which is probably the first day that that program went into uh, being. So Vermont is one of the first states to actually even uh, administer the vaccine in that setting on the 21st yesterday. So there was a 1,950 dose allocation last week of the Pfizer to that program. So that really couldn't have been touched last week at all because it wasn't even slated to be used until yesterday. Is that clear, the math? Okay. Yeah, and so does that 3,141 number include uh, the long-term care vaccinations that happened yesterday? No, that's that's um, that's that healthcare. System. That's healthcare system, hospitals. Okay, so that's only got it. Um, and uh, as far as the Moderna shipment, um, is any of that going to be allocated to the long-term care stream, or will that all go to the healthcare system? That's completely going to the healthcare system. The long-term care is uh, plugged into Pfizer regular shipments. Okay. Um, and then will will you be able to report those long-term care numbers that are happening, the vaccinations happening through the pharmacy system, or yes. will the state be reporting just the uh, the healthcare? Numbers. No, we will report uh, each independently and in aggregate. Okay, great. And will that reporting be something that happens through the pharmacy system or or will there be a way to get those numbers online? There, there will be presented at pressers and there is going to be an online way to access that as well. It will be on the uh, health department's okay. website. Okay, and when can we expect to see that? Uh, this week, I believe. Um, great, thank you. And ju just to keep in mind, the Moderna uh, vaccines came in to those hospitals yesterday uh, during the day. Um, so, uh, and the, the rest of the hospitals will get some, I think, some today. 
Um, so not everyone received them yesterday. And there will be, you know, just a forewarn everyone when you have a, a second, third, or fourth party involved, there could be a bit of a lag time in getting the results back. Uh, so it won't be instantaneous uh, numbers uh, from, uh, that I don't believe we'll be able to be, uh, uh, to be accomplished, I guess, until, you know, we get some, um, everything in, in a regular fashion. Okay, we'll move to Mike Donahue, the Islander. Congressman, well, uh, good to hear from you. Uh, I was wondering, uh, the leadership on both sides of the U.S. House always seems to be feuding and not much you're getting done in a timely fashion. Obviously, the long delay in the fact it shows in the House could probably benefit from new leadership on both sides people that can work across the aisle. Knowing you've got a long time your reputation for working across the aisle in both the House in Vermont and, and in Washington, what would it take for you to run for Speaker of the House? <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I don't have any plans to do that. But, you know, you make a point, Mike. Uh, it's We're not going to get through this uh, unless we do it together. And the argument I'm making to my colleagues is that this COVID crisis affects universally all of us with a threat to our health. It's not a red state, blue state deal. Every single one of us is threatened by COVID. Every single one of us have people we love who are threatened by COVID. And the financial impact affects everybody. Every one of us, Republican or Democrat, is impacted by what has happened in our economy to accommodate the health requirements to protect ourselves from COVID. So the argument I'm making is that what is a better moment in our history to try to come together to do something that needs to be done for every single American? That's the argument that I'm making day in and day out. And I think a lot of my Republican colleagues uh, see that. You know, broadband, I mentioned earlier, Mike, uh, there is now a consensus uh, that we have to have rural broadband uh, as essential to any opportunity for rural America to be in the game. Uh, also, in this legislation, just because you're at the Islander, uh, the, there is access to the PPP for our nonprofits and our small newspapers uh, and media companies. They were cut out last time. But all around America, there is enormous pressure on local news. So the point you make uh, in your question is really the broader point of why it is absolutely essential that if we're going to address the well-being of people who elected us and we serve, whether you're a Democrat who's serving Vermont or a Republican who's serving somewhere in Indiana, we have to do the same thing to help the people we represent. Well, clearly you get it, but I think there's some members down there that don't get it. That's what I'm concerned about. Well, it's, it's, it's the challenge, but, you know, I'll do my part uh, to try to bring the Vermont way to Washington. I think it works. So just to be clear, you would never, ever run for Speaker of the House? Right. I have no... That's correct. I'm not running for Speaker of the House now or next year. You don't want to, you know, would you take it if it was offered? <laughs> you know, you've gone from speculation to fantasy, Mike. <laughs> that kind of thing doesn't happen. Don't they want the best of the shot? Spe Speaker Welch just left, left the podium. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. All right, Lisa, the AP. Hi, thanks. Um, so how does the state plan to notify sort of the next priority group who will be eligible for the vaccine? Hi, Dr. Levine here. So first of all, we need to define the next priority group. But I would say that with a very high degree of certainty, it will be defined by age, 
And because it will be defined by age, there'll be a variety of ways to communicate uh, when that place has opened up, whether it be through traditional or other types of social media, etc. cetera. Um, we also anticipate that many in the oldest age groups, because they may actually have very close and enduring relationships with their own healthcare providers, um, and often see them fairly frequently, um, will be uh, always addressing that with their healthcare provider in general. Okay, thanks. And just so I'm clear, did, did Vermont follow the CDC advisory committee um, plan for the uh, phase one allocation? Yeah, for priority group 1A, we're in lockstep with that. Uh, so okay. the next group is priority group 1B. Okay. Um, okay, thank you very much. Greg, the county courier. Greg. Good morning, Governor. Good morning. Uh, good, good morning, Governor. In your introduction, you uh, talked about uh, mm -hmm. contact tracing as one of the big reasons we've seen success in Vermont. Uh, I'm told that contractor working on behalf of the state State of Maine USA laid off many of the contact tracers that they had employed yesterday. Um, why, why are we laying off contact tracers in the midst of a pandemic and as we expect at least a bit of a spike in the holiday uh, visits approaching? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not aware that we've laid anyone off. Craig, where did you say that came from? Um, I was told that it was a, a contractor called Dataman USA uh, contracting with the state of Vermont and, and possibly some other states, uh, but definitely people that were working from the state of Vermont. Um, that doesn't ring a bell at all. Uh, Secretary Smith, are you aware of anything of that nature? This is not ringing a bell at all with me, Governor. We have a, for contact tracing, we have um, individuals uh, that are brought in from uh, various state agencies, as well as a contractor, Maximus, but not anything that uh, I've heard of from from uh, this uh, this company. Yeah, because we've okay. actually, I'll Greg, we've more actually more sure. we've added uh, 140 uh, contact tracers to our, our existing team, so we've been building capacity. Appreciate that. I will look into that a little more. Yeah, if you if you uh, find out anything, please uh, give us a send us an email so we can chase that down. Certainly, will. I'll reach out to Rebecca on that. Uh, moving on, uh, wanted to ask you about a criminal case in Highgate recently where uh, two individuals impersonated your game wardens uh, at an elderly elderly couple's home. Uh, when the justice system release an individual into uh, Department of Corrections custody, it's indirectly under your control. Um, one of these individuals is, was sentenced less than a year ago to three years in prison to serve and, and obviously was released well before that three years. So I, I guess I'm wondering, from your point of view, is the Department of Corrections releasing people too early? Is there too much pressure to release inmates early? Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't know the specifics of that case, um, not in particular. Uh, but uh, as you probably know, since the pandemic hit, uh, we have been uh, releasing as uh, as necessary. Our the number of offenders in the system at this point is, I believe, a little over 300 fewer than a year ago. Um, so we have uh, been successful in reducing the population. Uh, trying to do it in a, a face and equitable manner, um, but uh, but I don't know the particulars of that case. It might be a, a okay. Jim Baker and, uh, uh, Jim Baker question. Okay, I can reach out to him. And uh, lastly, here, Governor, and I'll let you know. I know there's other people on the line. Uh, with another delay in delivery by UPS, uh, we obviously have gone through this with the dairy 
tests. Uh, I know it's early on with these latest tests, but what have you learned from the investigation into the very test being lost? And has UPS ever tried to, you know, reach out to the state, make it right? I don't know if these packages are insured, but yeah. Let let me just yeah. go back to the original, the uh, UPS case uh, previous to this, uh, and that was the one I think you're you're um, pointing to was the one that we had overnighted and then didn't end up getting to the road testing facility on time. Um, but that wasn't their fault. Um, that was uh, a mistake on our part. Uh, there was a box that needed to be checked uh, when it was shipped. Uh, if you have an overnight delivery on a weekend, uh, there's a secondary box that needs to be checked uh, to have Saturday delivery. That, that box was not checked, an error in our, on our part, not UPS. Um, so. Uh, they did what they were supposed to do. It was not delivered to the facility because that box wasn't checked and it arrived uh, too late uh, on uh, and tainted uh, the uh, specimens on, on Monday. So again, that's our fault. I don't know about uh, the specifics on this latest case and who, where that's at. What's that? Yeah, Governor, Secretary Smith. this is uh, yeah, yeah, Governor Mike Smith here. Um, we conducted uh, teacher testing on uh, December 15th and the 16th. There were 14 districts that were completed testing on those days. About 2,300 uh, teachers and staff were tested, um, 1,300 on uh, the 15th and just under 1,000 on the 16th. Um, 200 teachers and staff of Milton District High School were uh, were tested, but their results didn't make it to Broad or didn't make it to time on Broad. And about 95 teachers at the Berry School District. Milton shipped their um, their samples via UPS, uh, excuse me, U.S. Postal Service, and Berry shipped theirs UPS for overnight ship uh, shipping. We're trying to figure out what um, what happened with those results. Obviously, as um, uh, Commissioner Levine had talked about, we are um, looking at that right now. Those go directly from the school to the facility, and we'll see what uh, what transpired. We are retesting Milton today. And we will be retesting uh, Barry when they come back off of, off break. So that's the latest from uh, what Dr. Levine had uh, had reported earlier. Okay, thank you. Sean, the Chester Telegraph. Thank you. Uh, one of our readers has asked us um, how much of Eli Lilly's monoclonal antibody treatment the mod has received to date. And how many treatments have actually been administered and where in Vermont they can be administered? Dr. Levine? I'm going to interpret Eli Lilly as potentially Moderna, but I'm not a, I don't think so. So, you know, we have a Pfizer and we have a Moderna that have had emergency use authorization. I'm not familiar with either of those being connected to Eli Lilly. So, and there is no other vaccine that's received emergency use authorization. This, this is the monoc monoclonal antibody. Ah, gotcha. Okay. So the monoclonal antibody, um, there are two, uh, two, two treatments. One, one is uh, called Regeneron and the other, I only know it by the generic name, um, but they both actually come into Vermont. We were receiving approximately 20 doses per week, and I believe last week we actually got 40 doses. All of these have been distributed to hospitals around the state. I have to say the uptake of actually use of this has not been huge, and that's a problem not just uh, unique to Vermont, but it's nationwide, because the uh, medical community is not 100% sold on its efficacy. 
There have been a small number of studies that do show great promise, but some of the uh, guidance panels, including the NIH and the Infectious Disease Society of America, have not come out uh, saying that this should be a standard of practice, and they have left it more to what we call shared decision-making between a healthcare professional and their patient. I do think these show significant promise. I want to go on the record as saying that. Their goal is to take moderately ill patients who are outpatients, living at home, still able to cope at home with their illness, treat them early enough in their uh, illness course, and prevent them from having to be hospitalized. It's a complicated therapy in some ways because it requires an infusion center where people can sit for over an hour and have an intravenous infusion of the medication. Many, if not most, of our hospitals have the ability to do infusions. However, the risk to the hospital that they perceive as real is one of their infusion centers or rooms will then be COVID positive, because by definition, it's a COVID patient getting the treatment. And that would take away from people who are getting chemotherapy and other infusions at that uh, infusion site. So uh, there's been a reluctance to do that. And with the lack of uniform acclimation by the academic community and these guidance panels, it has slowed down the uptake. Again, not just in Vermont, but nationwide. But we have had it used in Vermont. I'm aware of several uh, cases where it has been used. We don't have enough cases or data to share with anybody about any conclusive results about how it did or did not uh, work. Anecdotally, it's what the President of the United States received uh, as part of the cocktail of things he received when he became ill. Um, so all I can tell you is we have plenty of it available. The uh, medical community is aware of it. Um, uh, working with colleagues at UVM Medical Center, they put out a statement about it that I thought was quite balanced, acknowledging the issues with it and the lack of enthusiasm, but also uh, providing a pathway for people to use it. Uh, and that's where we stand. Thank you very much. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. on unemployment benefits. Um, I know that extended benefits expired. Um, I am not clear on whether um, in addition to the $300 uh, supplemental benefit, um, the regular benefits have been extended for the 10 weeks as well. Um, someone explain to me? Yeah, I, I, I believe. Um Joe, that all the programs have been extended for that 11 weeks. Uh, I don't know if Speaker Welch wants to <laughs> add anything to that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, they, they, all the unemployment benefits have been extended uh, for uh, 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 10 or 11 weeks. Uh, that, by, by the way, that's going to be a looming issue. Uh, because this is brutal. If you uh, are not able to go return to work, if we don't have food, not back at unemployment, we're going to face this issue uh, soon again. And Governor, I remember you talking at one of your earlier press conferences about these 12,000 Vermonters who had no way to pay their bills, and thank goodness we were able to extend unemployment. But that's not a long time, and it's not a lot of security. So that, I think, is uh, a task that is going to await us again in D.C. Um, I, I'd like to offer my congratulations and condolences to the new speaker um, and also ask whether he has uh, confidence that Congress um, in the new administration, you know, on a, when the new administration comes in, is going to be able to work together to vote through um, new uh, support for the economy, you know, given the 
problems with COVID or whether after the election in Georgia is done, there will be a lack of interest in that. Yeah, no, in all candor, it's really going to be tough. Uh, I mean, the even you saw the history here. Senator McConnell was very resistant to doing anything. Eventually, there were a number of Republican senators, I think, and also Republican governors who made the case that we really have to have another supplemental package, uh, and uh, he accommodated that. But uh, you've got a new president, and uh, he is going to make his effort uh, to reach out because we're gonna need to work together to be successful uh, but there'll be an immense decision frankly that Senator McConnell has to make uh, depending on the outcome in Georgia but even whatever the outcome is in Georgia because it's knife edge I mean if the Democrats win two seats it's 50 50 and that's not much of a margin especially in the Senate so uh, I do think that a lot of the outside uh, advocacy from Republican governors that uh, Governor Scott's been working with from uh, some of those Republican senators and from some of my Republican colleagues in the House to say hey we are all in this together and let's assess where we're at uh, t two months from now uh, and again I go back to this point the vaccine is there we are within reach of a self-sustaining recovery we are in reach of a self-sustaining recovery but if we don't help those restaurants, those performance venues, those families make it to that other side, we're gonna have hollowed out communities in a deep hole that will be a big recession. So that logic applies universally, but we'll see. It's tough in the current climate in DC. Thank you very much. Liz, Burlington Free Press. Good afternoon. Uh, both of my questions, I think, are for Dr. Levine. Um, the first one is, um, you mentioned that the allotment this week is still the reduced number that you had um, announced on Friday. Um, do you expect, or for the Pfizer vaccine in particular, do you expect that this um, is going to be the new weekly allotment that Vermont is going to get, or do you think that number will go back up to um, the 5,000 range that we had seen before? What we've been told is they're going to make it good, so we'll eventually get what we were promised initially. But um, I think they're being a bit circumspect right now and not going out on a limb to say when you will have what just because of the concerns that uh, occurred last time when the, the doses weren't ready to be shipped out when they thought they would be. Uh, but I, I do fully expect we will get the 5,850 doses um, each week that we're supposed to get. It just may not come when we expect it. Okay, great. And the second question I have is, um, you said that the Vermont Advisory Group is going to be um, reviewing the, the National Advisory Group's decision on uh, the 1B priority group. Do you expect that um, Vermont is going to stray much from this recommendation? Or, um, you know, it, it, are there any differences that you expect will um, occur? Well, I, I don't want to be speaking for the group because they're independent of me, and that's the way it should be. Um, I, I know that they're obviously going to pay attention to what the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices advised the CDC. It doesn't mean they have to be in complete uh, lockstep with that by any means, but we'll see what they have to say. I'm sure it will be um, close or a variation on that. Keep in mind that any state uh, can really do what it wants to. And even in priority group 1A, I'm aware of at least one or two governors who made a decision to, uh, to go one pathway that wasn't exactly the way it was prescribed by the uh, advisory committee in Washington. And that's completely uh, their prerogative. So um, these are, are called advisory for a reason. Um, and they don't necessarily make the entire decision, but obviously these are people who uh, have expertise, uh, and especially in the area of ethics, which is really first and foremost one of the concerns and considerations when you design a priority group 
around a, a, a scarce resource, which vaccines should be considered a scarce resource for the next several months, actually. Okay? Yeah, just to follow up on that, when do you think Vermont's advisory group will make its final decision on decision or, or I, I believe this week. Okay. Thank you. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, Governor, my question comes from the pages of if you give a mouse a cookie, uh, with the return of limited sports activities, uh, what do you envision as a timeline for games? And will maintaining current case levels be enough to resume playing games, or uh, would you need to see a further reduction in cases? Yeah, you, you know, we just want to make sure, Andrew, that uh, that we're not going in the other direction. Uh, if we can continue uh, to see the case levels uh, sustain uh, the levels we are now, or uh, you know, hopefully go down, uh, but certainly not uh, become elevated, that would be a concern from our standpoint. And uh, so w what kind of duration at, at least a sustained level would you need to see into well, early January, mid-January? Yeah, no, I would say um, we certainly want to watch what happens over the uh, the holiday, uh, Christmas and uh, New Year's. Uh, so you, you take 7 to 14 days after both of those days uh, will give us a, a good indication of what's going on. So that's what we'll be watching. So I would, I would anticipate uh, we would uh, we would be able to make some decisions uh, by mid January. Uh, we'll we'll see what's happening by that point. Okay. And um, uh, for I guess speaker in waiting, Welch, um, you mentioned some. It's just a rumor, Andrew. It's just a rumor. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned some provisions in the stimulus package designed to benefit local news outlets. Uh, can you outline some of, some of what that is, and is it different than um, what other types of businesses uh, are eligible for? Um, well, what it does, it, in the previous CARES package, the payroll, the, the, uh, the PPP program uh, was not available uh, to news organizations. And that's changed in this organization, in this uh, legislation. So those independent news organizations would be able to make application uh, to get the PPP benefits under uh, this legislation. And again, you know, that's a, you guys are under such pressure. We know that. Uh, all the advertising is going uh, to the big platforms. Uh, but you are now at a moment where what you provide, the service you provide, is incredibly important. There's never been a greater demand for local news than right now. But the economic model doesn't support you because those restaurants, those local organizations that would buy advertising in your publications are hammered. So your readers want the news. Uh, but you don't have the advertising base. So I think it was a big oversight not to include you in the CARES package, uh, but you are now included in, the, uh, in, in this legislation we just passed. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Andrew, well, from what I understand as well, and maybe uh, Congressman Welch can substantiate this if he knows, but uh, I believe that anyone, there are a couple banks already ready, uh, willing, and able. Uh, if you had not, made application before had not received a PPP uh, previous uh, to this that you could you could actually make out an application now um, right. but if if you've made an application previous to this and have been awarded there's another form uh, that we are going to have to receive in order to uh, to forward your application now the other part that I don't know is uh, is this first come first serve like it was before um, and uh, you know, Vermont did very well and came to the, the table early and often, and I think that, that should be the case this time if we can. Uh, yeah, I, that's, that's my understanding, Governor. I mean, don't waste any time on seeing what your eligibility is. Get your applications in. Our banks do have, <clears throat> of course, a lot of experience, and uh, my understanding is that uh, our businesses that used our banks were really happy. Uh, also, we had a record in Vermont, uh, not only of uh, top-line success uh, that, that the governor mentioned, but we really had uh, a lot of smaller companies that didn't get crowded out, as did happen in some of the bigger states. 
and I think that's a function of uh, our banks having relationships with a lot of our, our smaller uh, entities. All right, we'll move to Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Hello, in our community and in resort communities across the state, there are many second homeowners who've been here since March, sheltering in Vermont for the duration of the pandemic. Will those people be able to get vaccinated here, or will they have to return to their home state for a vaccine? That's a good question, sir. Many, many of those, I assume, might even have health care in the state. Um, so I think we've taken the tack that people can get vaccinated in the state. For instance, we have a number of people in Priority Group 1A who work at Dartmouth um, and, would, and would potentially get their vaccine in New Hampshire, uh, even though they're Vermont residents who work in Dartmouth. Likewise, there are people who live in New York State who come across to work at some of our hospitals in um, the western side of Vermont that also will count on those hospitals to provide their vaccine. So I, I, I do think that's how it will work in the end. Great, thank you very much. Ed, Newport Daily Express. Yeah, Representative Wells, this package is going, is, is going to now, but it's like kicking the can down the road, what seems to be the Congress has been doing for almost a generation. Uh, as the governor and the legislators build their, their state budgets forward in the future, uh, what can they expect for more help in three months down the road or six months down the road? Will there be more money from be able to continue to try to uh, keep the economy straight, or will the uh, Republicans in the Senate turn around and decide they don't want to spend it, they don't want to increase the deficit, and the uh, tap runs dry? Well, that's a, you described the dynamic. I mean, there's, I think, a majority of us, certainly in the, in the House, who believe strongly that we've got to have financial aid for the states and our municipalities. In fact, many of my Republican colleagues uh, were in agreement uh, with me on that. This is in the Senate. Uh, but what will happen down the road, number one, uh, President Biden, or Vice President-elect Biden is, is committed to state and local aid. He understands how important that is. Number two, I sense Governor Scott can speak to this, but uh, the Republican governors, by and large, are advocates for uh, state, aid, state and local aid. Uh, and number three, the politics are just going to have to sort themselves out because there is some significant res resistance uh, with Senator McConnell, who you remember famously said that the states should uh, consider bankruptcy as an option. Uh, and of course, that's a catastrophe. It's not an option. So what you're describing awaits us and is a constant battle. But let's put this also in some other perspective. Uh, with the p pandemic in March, within a week, uh, we had a negotiation between Speaker Pelosi and uh, uh, Senator McConnell, Majority Leader McConnell, and President Trump uh, for the $2.2 trillion CARES package. I mean, that is enormous. And then we had this long period of almost uh, eight months trying to get to a second package. And, uh, but ultimately, uh, we passed a bill, it's $900 billion uh, that does provide aid. In some areas, less than I think we need. Uh, but that's a big deal. Uh, if you look back when we had the economic crisis of 2008, and the package that Congress passed then with great debate, uh, the American Recovery Act, that was, uh, that was about $750 billion. So even this package, $900 billion, which is a lot less than what we had passed in the House several months ago, uh, is significantly higher than what we had passed before. But you know, the bottom line for me on this is let's remember that the end is in sight. And we've got to get everybody across that bridge to that vaccine intact. That's it. Leave nobody behind. And what's it going to take? In my view, you know, this is borrowed money. Let's be candid. 
But it's my judgment, and I think many economists agree, <clears throat> that we're much better off making certain that everybody can get to that other side so that we can then have a self-sustaining recovery uh, and return to life as normal. Hey, Governor, you want to add anything to that? Um, as you're looking for your whole thing to, with the vaccine in place that you can kind of see the finish line. Yeah. Um, but you're still going to need the finances to, to get to get from our process finish line. Yeah, again, I, you know, I, I think you just have to look at uh, history over the last uh, six months. Had it not been uh, for the aid from Congress, we wouldn't be in the great position we are today. And, uh, and uh, I think it's essential uh, for us, as Congressman Welch had, had said, uh, for us to get across the finish line intact, to make sure that these businesses survive so that they can thrive in the future, to provide the opportunity, to provide the jobs, to provide families the, the income that they need. Um, it's essential we keep it together. So. Uh, again, we will uh, do everything we can here in Vermont. We're, we're appreciative of all the aid and all the efforts of our congressional delegation. Uh, Senator Leahy's done a great job uh, with, the, with the budget bill, $1.4 trillion uh, bill uh, that does have a lot of uh, initiatives for Vermont in that. Uh, but these, uh, these, two, um, the, these two stimulus packages has been, have been uh, essential uh, to us here in Vermont. And we're just going to need just a little bit more help. So I'm hopeful, um, and I know the National Governors Association, uh, both Republicans and Democrats, um, not across the board. I wouldn't say that everyone is in agreement, uh, but uh, Governor Cuomo is the chair of the NGA of New York, Democrat. Um, the vice chair is uh, uh, Governor Hutchinson. He's a Hutchinson uh, from Arkansas. And, uh, and I would say uh, that they, we will continue to work and advocate uh, for more financial support and more stimulus as time goes on to get us through again. The next four, five, six months are going to be uh, a pivotal moment for our country. And, uh, and thus far, we've done all the right things. Uh, we just need a little bit more. Great. Thank you. And uh, happy holidays for everyone. Thank you very much. Tim, Vermont Thank Business you. Magazine. You know, I'm not sure I understand uh, what your question is. Well, the, the PPP um, that small businesses receive are now feeling like they have to pay federal tax on that money. And, it's, and it, was, it was sort of seen as we wouldn't have to pay the tax on it, but now their uh, small businesses are concerned that they got yeah. to Well, you're right. That was a, a lot of money. Right. That, that, yeah. that, yeah. Let me try to answer that. Uh, the Secretary Mnuchin has really been very insistent on this, and his position is that what a business gets, for instance, to use to make payroll um, is a deduction, but they don't on top of that get a uh, tax credit. And he has been consistently calling that double dipping. Uh, so my understanding is that if you have an expense as a business and you deduct that expense, you don't owe taxes on that deduction. Uh, and what Secretary Mnuchin has been saying that if you get this money that is used for payroll, you don't you 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 you, you don't have to pay taxes on it, uh, but you do get the deduction. Secretary might have the answer. I'm not sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Secretary Curley, do you have any additional information? I don't have anything to add on that. Okay. Yeah, if we get more information, yeah, Tim, if we get more information, we'll uh, certainly send it your way. Yeah, there's a lot of actually consternation out there, Governor, about this because, you know, the, maybe the du deduction on one side, but then it leaves you with uh, a profit you weren't expecting on the other. Yeah. 
you know, I, I understand the issue. We'll just have to get it clarified right? because I'm not sure. Okay. I agree with that. All right, Aaron, BT Digger. Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> on um, dose patients received and people vaccinated in Vermont, when is that data going to start being published? Um, you know, so we can see it on a regular basis. I can do analysis on it and we don't have to have you repeating every single number every single week. I believe. Are you talking about the, which, which, uh, are you talking about the vaccinations, Karen? Yes, the vaccinations. Like the number of people vaccinated and the doses received by the yeah, state. Yeah, I believe we're developing a platform as we speak. I don't know if uh, Dr. Levine or Secretary Smith. I think Dr. Levine just answered that it was going to be this week, up this week. We hope it will be up. That we hope it will be up this week. Who's answered that? Oh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I missed that uh, part. All right. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Matt, NBC5. Thank you. Uh, questions for both Governor Scott and uh, Representative Walsh. Um, there's been a number of members in Congress who have already received the COVID-19 vaccine um, ahead of, you know, those healthcare workers on the front lines um, and as well as those in long-term care facilities. First for Governor Scott, do you, do you agree with members of Congress should get this vaccine ahead of, you know, those who are most vulnerable. Yeah. And uh, Representative Walsh, same question for you would be, you know, have you gotten the vaccine and what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't want to judge anyone. Uh, certainly the continuity of government is important. Um, from my standpoint, uh, as I said before, it just doesn't sit right uh, with me. I personally, uh, I'm on the ground. I'm, I'm, you know, we're working 24 seven here, I see uh, all the need and uh, and I've tried to uh, focus our team on the most vulnerable, uh, making sure with everything that we do, whether it's vaccines or testing or uh, uh, contact tracing, anything, uh, we focus on the most vulnerable, those in long-term care facilities, those in uh, assisted living uh, and so forth. So everything we do is geared towards that. So when I see that, and, and again, we're, we're an uh, aging state, uh, we have a demographic issue on our hands. Uh, we had it before, uh, but that leads to uh, more vulnerable uh, Vermonters, and and I just feel that uh, I can wait. I can wait my turn uh, here in Vermont. I'm I'm healthy. I'm uh, I'm being careful, uh, but uh, but I see those uh, who uh, can be careful, but they're interacting with others every on a daily basis, and uh, it puts them at risk. And uh, and I I just feel from my standpoint. Uh, here in the state, uh, dealing with this day in and day out, that it's important uh, that they receive the, the vaccine before I do. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, th uh, thank you for that. The I have not uh, been vaccinated. Uh, I expect that I will be getting vaccinated at the Capitol sometime in January. Uh, the attending physician is the one that makes the recommendations and it's also under the Continuity of Government Act. Uh, and there's two issues, uh, actually three issues. One is what the governor was just talking about and getting the vaccine out to everybody. And my view on this is that everybody should get vaccinated as soon as they can and as soon as their opportunity comes. The second is that the attending physician, he's definitely recommending that everybody in Congress under the Continuity of Government Act get uh, vaccinated and there's two issues there uh, for uh, for me, for everyone really. One is the vaccination obviously is gonna protect the person vaccinated, but number two, if we'll be traveling back and forth uh, to Washington on a pretty regular basis come January. And it's also important that uh, I not be in a position to be a spreader to Vermonters. So I expect I'll be getting my vaccination sometime in January. Great, thank you. Avery, WCAX. Dr. Levine, who is considered a frontline healthcare worker when it comes to home health workers? Uh, 
a home health worker does satisfy the criteria for being a frontline health worker. And they are they are they are in priority group one A. Okay. And we've been given and we've been given a list of their names uh, from the agency that deals with that. Okay. So it doesn't matter regardless of what company they work for. Should should not if if they are directly interacting with um, Vermonters in their homes as part of the delivery of health care. That is all that it requires. Okay, thank you. Guy Page. Congressman Welch, if, and, and I know it's a big if, you are persuaded either before or after Inauguration Day that the 2020 general was the victim of significant electoral fraud. Would you call for and support House investigation? You know, there's no basis for that. I mean, we just saw Attorney General Barr, Attorney General Barr, the appointee of President Trump, state that he would not appoint a special prosecutor because there was absolutely no evidence to support the allegation that there was any significant electoral fraud. It's not there. So the answer is no. We've got to move on. We have a president-elect, the people have spoken, and we've got work to do. Um, Governor Scott, your office has the power to pardon people convicted of crimes. Um, are you considering any pardons, and if so, what are the criteria? Um, well, there is a process, uh, and it uh, and it's very lengthy in some respects. Uh, involves the parole board and other entities. Um, at this point in time, over the last four years, I have not uh, pardoned anyone. I have a fairly high bar on that. Uh, but uh, but I think about uh, some who have applied, um, still uh, thinking about uh, whether um, I would move forward uh, with uh, with a pardon on some of those. But uh, but at this point in time, uh, have not done anything in terms of pardoning uh, anyone. Thank you, Courtney, local twenty two. Courtney, local 22. Okay, we'll move to John, VPR. Thank you. Governor, looking back at our 2020 and, and all the impacts of the pandemic, dairy farmers really, really took it on the chin. We lost, um, according to the agency's account, 58 uh, during the last year. Um, and I, I'm just, I wonder if you see a need to, to sort of pull Vermont, if possible, out of this commodity dairy market, which um, for, for many farmers has become a race to the bottom. Um, we can't compete on price with, with other regions of the country. Do you see the need for your office and the agency to offer a, a sort of a new vision for dairy beyond this commodity market that we're currently in? Yeah, there's no doubt that uh, our dairy farmers have been struggling uh, for quite quite some time. Uh, we are losing a, a rapid number of farms pre-pandemic, and uh, and after the pandemic hit, uh, it had exacerbated uh, the issue. Um, so we um, we were very fortunate again uh, to utilize some of the CARES funding uh, to help some of them who are struggling and keep them healthy because I think it's vital. It's part of our our uh, DNA in some respects. Uh, uh, I know that many farms are diversifying at this point, which is good. Um, not putting all our eggs in one basket. And, and I think that the uh, the good news is, from what I've heard, um, and Secretary Tebbets, I'm not sure if he's on or not. I might want to comment. Uh, he's not. Um, but um, but the things have stabilized a bit of late, and, uh, and hopefully uh, that we see the reduction of uh, the number of farms in Vermont uh, subside. Uh, so uh, obviously uh, we want them to be um, part of the future. Uh, we need 
to feed ourselves. Uh, I think that some of the the uh, products that are made with with Vermont uh, dairy uh, milk and so forth is uh, is essential to whether it's butter, uh, uh, whether it's yogurt, uh, whether it's cheese. Um, all of these are, are value-added prod products, and uh, and I think it, again it's vital that we have a dairy industry here. So happy to uh, again we're we're trying to do everything we can. Uh, we need a. a the legislature's uh, involvement as well, and we'll continue to work towards uh, making sure that they uh, they survive as well. Okay, um, I'm just, but sort of beyond all that, you, you see a need for some sort of fundamental change in, in, you know, perhaps a new vision for our dairy farm economy, since we are in this commodity market that we're really not surviving in. Um, if you look at the long term. Yeah, but I think we are, um, I think things are leveling out. Uh, I think uh, that, that uh, they may be a little bit healthier at this point uh, in the pandemic, and hopefully that when we get out of the pandemic, uh, they'll begin to thrive again. But, but again, we're, we're looking for any opportunity uh, to keep them intact, because I think it's essential. Again, I think it's part of who we are and, uh, and part of our backbone. So. I, I still continue to believe uh, that dairy has a significant place uh, for us here in Vermont and is uh, vital to our economy. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Hoffman, Vermont Dairy Farmers Association. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Great, thank you. Uh, well, one for Congressman Mel uh, Welch and maybe one for Dr. Levine, if I may. Uh, uh, Congressman, we're, we're about the same age. I might be a couple years older than you. And, but all my life, uh, I've watched um, folks arrive in Washington um, virtually penniless. And yet, after a few years of serving the public in uh, D.C., uh, it seems that either they themselves or their families or both um, just personally enrich themselves uh, way beyond, you know, any kind of reason. Would you support, uh, you know, a better uh, or, or closer uh, look through a, a, an ethics committee with more teeth um, that would uh, maybe uh, maybe stop or slow some of this kind of behavior? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, you know, members of Congress have to file financial disclosures. Uh, we also have to report every month any stock transactions that may take place. Uh, I've pledged to not uh, trade in individual stocks. Uh, you know, we saw what's going on uh, with uh, Senator Perdue in, uh, in, in the investigation there about a lot of transactions that were made around the time of the virus. Uh, so I do favor uh, transparency, uh, disclosure, um, and uh, uh, strong ethics uh, standards. Steve, but with the families too. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Yes, with the families. Yeah. Uh, great. Um, Dr. Levine, if I may, uh, I've been looking at the, uh, the differences uh, with Japan. Um, they've had some restrictions, but they've had no lockdowns, and neither has Mexico. Um, Japan, they don't count for like heart attacks or COVID deaths, uh, and they're not using PCR tests on everyone. Uh, and if they have no symptoms, they're not considered sick or isolated. And Tokyo alone has reached a herd immunity of like 50%, which is the same number that Pfizer is hoping for with a vaccine. Uh, is Japan doing something uh, that we might want to look at? I'm not sure, to tell you the truth, Steve. Um, you know, Japan is not one of the countries that comes up a lot when I'm uh, seeing experiences around the world. Um, so it sounds very favorable 
although I recall they went through a very hard phase was, uh, way earlier in the pandemic. Um, and because their average age is also, it's kind of like Vermont, they have an aging demographic in Japan as well. Um, there were a lot of concerns early on about that. So I'm hopeful that what you're saying, um, you're making it look like a rosy picture and a rosy outcome, and I'm hoping that's true, because sometimes the cost of achieving that herd immunity brings with it a lot of casualties uh, who generally are in the more vulnerable groups. But I have to research a little bit more about what Japan has done to really answer your question uh, effectively. Yeah, well, their, well, their, uh, their uh, confirmed fatality rate is about, um, you know, uh, 22 per, uh, per million, where as lockdown states like Italy is 130, uh, 1,133 per million, uh, Spain is 1046 per million, and the U.S. is around 970 uh, per million. Um, so, th I mean, the numbers are there. Um, maybe, maybe is it something we could look into? Yeah, and yeah. please send me some of your references. Uh, I'd be happy to look at them, okay? Okay, should I send them through Ben? Please do. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, Steve, I, I did want to tell you, I meant to tell you on uh, Friday that uh, we did look into the recycling of the styrofoam packaging and um, we are sending that back uh, to the manufacturer for reuse. So with that, um, we'll see you on Thursday, correct? And uh, have more information for Governor? you. I, I, I want to do one extra thank sure. you, um, and I want to thank all of the workers in Vermont. Uh, two of my uh, our sons came home. Uh, they had a quarantine for a week. Uh, then they got the free test. They tested negative, and they're going to be home for Christmas. And it's like, it works. You guys are doing a good job. So from my wife and I, we say thank you for uh, allowing us to have, <laughs> because of your good work. Uh, a nice family Christmas, and everybody have a good holiday. Thank you very much.